The government announces a tectonic shift in its oil exploration policy. Junks, the cost recovery model, new production sharing contracts will be based on a simplified revenue sharing. 69 small and marginal oil fields will be the first to be auctioned based on this model. Markets end at their lowest level of the day as the bears continue launching an attack. The Nifty tests the 7,700 mark. The Sensex sheds nearly 250 points. Shares rebound on Wall Street. The Dow jumps over 100 points. European markets rise in tandem. Crude prices stabilize with the Brent hovering around the $50 mark. Automakers are cautiously optimistic at the 55th annual SAM convention. Most expect a full recovery only after FY17. Car makers are the most upbeat. We now are opening a new factory in Pune in the beginning of next year, which also is going to do transmission equipment, but not only for the Indian market. Now we're going to export from India. Ericsson commits to make in India. The global CEO says the new Pune factory will be operational from next year and will export to 180 countries with India as the hub. In a bid to revive UMPPs, the committee headed by former CBC Pratyush Sinha proposes to remove hurdles on ownership, financing and payments. But analysts say the proposals are not completely on the line of the plug-and-play model. There's a 2% CSR that the government has come up with. That's also an opportunity. You have to spend this 2% of your profit as CSR. You can invest your CSR money in creating social business. Nobel laureate Mohammad Yunus believes India's CSR regime presents a business opportunity. Says his next mission will be to achieve zero poverty, zero unemployment and zero carbon emission. That's an explicit. Union Minister Rajiv Pratap Rudi has a grudge against the private sector. Speaking on the Google Hangout, he says India Inc. is not doing enough to support the government's Skill India mission. ज्यादा हो गया लेकिन अमीर अमीर होते जा रहे हैं गरीब गरीब होते जा रहे हैं आम आदमी मजदूर आदमी इस सरकार के केंद्र में कहीं नहीं है नीतियां इस तरीके की बनाई जा रही हैं तो उद्योगपतियों को लाभ हो रहा है ये हड़ताल केंद्र सरकार को चेतावनी होगी कि सरकार अपनी जन एवं श्रम विरोधी नीतियों को भ्राम दे अन्यथा आगे आने वाले दिनों में और हड़तालों का सामना करने के लिए तैयार रहे There was chaos, there was violence and there were arrests as 5,000 unions participated in the countrywide general strike called by 10 central trade unions. The strike hit essential services including banking and insurance, transport, port and dock operations, coal mining and manufacturing units. Absolutely, Nantara, I mean, it, uh, industry body Assocham is estimating a loss of almost 25,000 crore rupees to the economy because of this strike call that was given by central trade unions. And while unions went up in arms, the Bears launched their own version of another onslaught on the last street today. That's right, Sir Meech, just a day after the government came out and clarified that massive mat issue, there was still no respite on the Lal Street. The best took the market to the lowest levels in over a year. The Nifty, you know, it even gave up on 7,700 during the trading session, but then managed to end about 17 points above that crucial level, but we still saw losses of nearly a percent. The Sensex, that crashed by 250 points. Both the major indices ended the day at their lowest levels, and get this, 13 months. Mid-caps also fell in tandem with the blue chips, but the losses were not that steep. And today, you cannot blame this on Global Cues. We'll tell you how the Global Cues performed in trade, and they rebounded. Sonia Shanai joining us to wrap up today's trading action. Sonia, today it was all about bears, and we can't blame the Global Cues. 
oh yes they are and you know what this market has become technically extremely weak so one would have thought that you could see some amount of rebound after you know a, a fall that we saw in the last 2 to 3 days but no none of that has actually come about so the sensex and the nifty have ended at about 13 month closing lows the nifty in fact slipped below the 7700 mark intraday and the bank nifty was the biggest disappointment today the bank nifty cracked in trade and is now in a bear market of its own the bank nifty down about 22 percent from the 2015 highs uh, also apart from the banks the uh, auto sector has been quite weak because of the weak august sales so there was a pressure seen across all rate sensitives today now we saw that the cash market volumes were quite high more than 18,000 crores and the buzz is that there was large one large basket selling order of 300 crores by FII's so I won't be surprised to see another sell figure come in a big sell figure come in from FII's tomorrow also we've had more and more brokerages go ahead and cut their sensex targets because of the global situation CLSA was the late, latest one in that list it cut its sensex target by 6% to 30,000 by December 2016. But let me take you through the stocks that got hit hard today. The biggest losers were the banks, undoubtedly. So you had PNB, SBI, Axis Bank, ICICI Bank that were all down anywhere between 2 to 4 odd percent. In fact, ICICI Bank is now down 25 percent this year and is sitting at a fresh 52 week low. Apart from that, autos like MM, Bajaj Auto, Hero Motor Corp, and Tata Motors all reported uh, you know, weak to lackluster uh, numbers this month and all of them were down anywhere between 1 to about 2 odd percent. In the oil and gas space as well, you had ONGC KN and BPCL that were under pressure. Capital goods like BHEL and LNT were under pressure. So as you can see, it was a secular run on the downside that we saw. But which were the stocks that saw some respite? There was technology that led some support to the market. So you had Tech Mahindra, TCS and Infosys that were not too bad. Cement stocks did well, so Ultratech, ACC and Ambuja buck the trend today all of them up about one odd percent but the mid cap space had a very interesting trend a lot of the non-index large caps the ones that have given big returns this year came in for profit taking today so there's LIC housing finance Glenmark Pharma Titan HPCL Union Bank all of these stocks were down anywhere between five to six odd percent but on the gaining end we did have some favor uh, back in the pharma space Dishman Pharma was a big mover Sun TV surged in late trade and one theme that stood out today was the mid cap FMCG name so Imami and Dabur were stocks that did quite well but all in all another weekday and the market has been moving only one way and that's southwards back to you all right Sonia thank you so much for that and speaking of the markets commodities guru and hedge fund manager Jim Rogers has sold all of his holdings in Indian companies speaking exclusively to Mint Rogers said and I quote I did sell my India shares as I don't see anything happening the market was high and investors had anticipated great things including me even if the Modi wave uh, were to come through and if Modi were to do things, the market had already discounted some part of that because it had gone up a lot and there was nothing new coming from Modi. You can't just invest on hope. Even if reforms started coming, it may not be enough to make the markets go higher because markets have already factored it in. If reforms are substantial, the markets may go higher. No indication of that. End of quote. Okay, so lackluster day for India, but it's looking good on Wall Street. In fact, we're seeing uh, stocks jump higher, trying to recover from what has been the worst start to September in 13 years. Investors are eyeing uh, karma, global markets, as well as domestic data. In fact, all eyes are on the jobs report, which comes out on Friday. And ahead of that, the ADP, the private sector payrolls report that has come out, is indicating lesser jobs added than what was anticipated market hoping that that will make sure that the Federal Reserve doesn't raise rates. And you've got a nice rally. Technology stocks are taking the Nasdaq almost a percent higher there. Quick check on Europe as well. Uh, recovery today as well. Most of the markets rallying, reversing earlier losses as Wall Street saw that major bounce back. And of course, most of the Asian markets managed to pare down some of the early losses that we've seen today. So the, the picture is not that bad, Nantara. At least some green finally on the Western screens. And you know what, Sylvia, like I said today, India was the aberration. Global markets have been performing well. You've discussed Europe, you've discussed US. Now let's talk about what's been the trigger for all of these markets, China. The markets in China managed to recuperate from early losses, ending only 0.2% lower. The Shanghai Composite initially tumbled by over 4% at the start of the final session. The country breaks for a four-day holiday to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Meanwhile, China is imposing fresh controls to prevent too much money from leaving its 
mortgage shows the country's central bank therefore is deciding it's going to make it more expensive for investors to pressurize the yuan to weaken against the U.S. dollar. So smart recovery is what you saw in China. It is still in the red, but it was a smart rebound. We discussed India, we discussed China. Now let's tell you about the rest of Asia. The Japanese Nikkei, that end of the day, four-tenth of a percent lower. But when you see it compared to yesterday's closing, it's pretty good. Yesterday we saw the Nikkei going home four percent in the red. The Hang Seng in Hong Kong, once again having a bad day in trade today, down by 250 points or a little over a percent. The South Korean cost be just about ending in the green. Uh, so that's the picture as far as Asian markets go. And today, sir, we've also seen crude prices stabilize. Well, Nantara, the slide is back. I'll tell you that oil prices have been sliding ever since we got that U.S. government uh, report. Data showing that crude stockpiles have unexpectedly risen by as much as 4.7 million barrels. Refinery throughput uh, fell for the fourth week running. Imports jumped. And as a result, you're seeing the pressure on NYMEX very apparent. 3% lower on uh, that, uh, that particular contract. Brent also low by about 2% right now. But speaking of oil, Nantara, you've got the big domestic story. That's right, it is coming in from the oil and gas space. It's a landmark change to India's hydrocarbon exploration regime. The union cabinet has approved a new simplified revenue sharing model to replace the current production sharing contracts. This was first mooted by the Siranga Rajan committee three years back to the UPA government. The new model reduces the role of the government by cutting the red tape so you don't need approvals for everything anymore. This model will first be tried out with 69 small and marginal oil fields that... Um, will be auctioned and all of these blocks I would like to point out have been relinquished at some point or the other the majority of which were the state run ONGC and Oil India. Under the new model private companies that win these oil fields can either sell the oil and gas at prevailing market rates the company that offers a higher revenue share or percentage of oil and gas to the government is the one that's going to win the field. Petroleum Minister Dharmendra Pradhan explaining the rationale behind this move and saying why he is convinced global companies will actually invest in these 69 blocks. This is a discover field. There is no need to explore any new exploration. This is all open. There is a lot of money in this field. There is a lot of money in this field. कि एक रिसोर्स यहां पड़ा है जिसको एक मॉनिटाइज हम भारतीय मुद्रा में करते तो 70000 करोड़ रुपए की और सालाना 3500 करोड़ रुपए की आज की प्राइस में फिर उसमें से जो उत्पाद जब ये 3500 करोड़ रुपए बिक्री होगी उसकी रॉयल्टी उसकी रेवेन्यू शेयरिंग फिर उसकी इनकम टैक्स ये तीनों चीज सरकार के खजाने में आए कि ये हमारी सेक्टर की और हमारी सरकार की फिश पेट्रोलियम सेक्टर के लिए नई फिजिकल पॉलिसी की एक पैराडाइम शिफ्ट है now, how successful will this new policy be remains to be seen. But the fact is that a lot of support service companies which are participating in the oil and gas space, those stocks were on fire today, whether it's a Jindal drilling or an Aban offshore, Ceylon exploration, lots of smaller companies, mid-cap companies. Look at the gains. I mean, some of those stocks that were all hitting 20% upper circuit today. But Nantara, the critical question is, I mean, this was a, a great trading bounce that we saw today. I guess the bigger question is whether the big boys, international or local big boys, whether they'll actually come back this time to these 69 fields. These are small and marginal fields, Surbi. So, you know, at a time when you've seen the kind of volatility in the crude markets, in the gas markets, it's very difficult to believe that global make, uh, majors, uh, big private companies back home are going to be investing in all of these 69 oil and gas blocks. It's still risky to do so. And, uh, you know, the returns, are they going to justify these kind of investments is a big question. Uh, for example, look at BHP Billiton, its net profit, uh, the global net profit fell by 86% in the quarter that has just concluded. So is it going to go out and, you know, commit new investments? In fact, we're seeing everybody cut CapEx except for the state-run oil majors back home. So that's one point. The second point to watch out for, uh, and that is what uh, the government has based its entire decision on. Because you're seeing this kind of volatility, because you're seeing this kind of crash in the crude markets, the ancillary companies have started offering their services at much lower rates. So rigs, for example, are available at much lower rates than they were earlier. And that's what Dharmendra Pradhan told me in a Q&A that, uh, you know, a company will hire these rigs at a cheaper cost, 
uh, explore all of these oil and gas blocks and will be able uh, to produce uh, the, all of this oil when the crude market rebounds. The big takeaway for me actually has been the decision to shift the revenue sharing model, cut out the red tape, cut out possible litigation and arbitration because you had a case where the CAG, the oil ministry, was intervening too much, was delaying approvals. So that, of course, is a big plus when we talk about policy. All right. Uh, well, on that note, let's move on to a big CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Swedish telecom giant Ericsson has committed to the government's Make in India drive and has identified India as an export hub for its transmission equipment. The global CEO of the company, Hans Wetzberg, told CNBC TV 18's Donna Joy Banerjee that the new upcoming plant in Pune, which will be operational by the first half of 2016, will export to 180 countries. He also said that Ericsson had entered into a four-year contract with Bharti Airtel for the rollout of 4G services in New Delhi and another 3G contract for eight telecom circles in the country. The next step right now that we have announced is that we now are opening a new factory in Pune in beginning of next year, which also is going to do transmission equipment, but not only for the Indian market. Now we're going to export from India as well. So for us, India has been very important for the transformation, and, and we are, have been investing a lot in India. So tell us a little bit about this plant. How much are you investing? And when do we see this plant becoming operational? We believe that somewhere in the second quarter next year it's going to be operational. If you only take the plant as such, it's probably 15 or 20 million US dollars. But it's everything else that is included. And of course, if we're going to have export to 180 countries, we are in 180 countries in the world, it's going to be far more investments over time. So that plant is going to export to 180 countries? Uh, that's the plan. We're yeah. going to have our transmission equipment coming from one factory, and that's the Pune factory. So. I think that's part of how we're transforming the company as well. I mean, we have less hardware. We can have one factory basically in the whole world. Now we're selected to do that uh, for transmission here in India. I, uh, I started this by asking that India is one of your top markets, the third largest, but its contribution is still about 5% of your overall revenues. Going forward, the kind of investments that you're making, the, the way in which you're sort of hiking your overall employee strength, will India's share in your overall revenues go up? I think that... Uh, the digital transformation of the country of India is going to help us with that because I think that right now it's 900 million plus uh, mobile subscriptions in India. It will go to 1.4. The majority of the Indian population has still a 2G phone. But with the deployment right now of 3G and 4G, we're going to look here in, in a couple of years of a vast majority of the Indians actually having 3G and 4G. That is going to transform India in many cases. And of course, that's a great opportunity for Ericsson as well, both on infrastructure, services, and we're into building system and IT system as well. So I think that given that it's the second largest country when it comes to population in the world, and the 21st one century infrastructure, which we're now coming in with, with, with a sort of the mobility broadband and cloud, will be so transformative. So, of course, I have very high hopes for India that uh, we're going to continue to invest and grow here. And, uh, and the share may also go up. We hope so. I mean, every country is fighting for it. So we usually, as if you're in 180 countries, there, there are very few countries that really sticks out. I mean, but India sticks out. I think U.S. has been very strong for us uh, the last couple of years and almost stands for a fifth of our revenue. But uh, other than that, there are many small, many countries all around the world that stands up for our total. Mr. Vesberg, over the last seven to ten years, the nature of competition has also changed. The competition landscape has entirely changed. Yes. And, and European companies like yourself, Nokia, Alcatel, Lucille is facing a lot of competition from the Chinese uh, firms like Huawei. Um, what is your strategy? How are you looking to fight competition? Because many would say companies like you have been forced to change your business model because of competition from the East. Just tell us a little bit about the changing dynamics of this. Now, the change in dynamic is that I mean, if you look at the traditional area that we're into, mobile infrastructure, I mean, uh, I usually say that 10 years ago, 15 companies in the world could supply a 2G network. I would say it's probably three left. And uh, one has the same brand name and the same company. And massive that's a, consolidation. A massive consolidation. And that's a typical of a technology revolution because you need to change in order to be relevant. Ericsson is the only company that has been on both sides. One Chinese vendor came in the middle, done a great job, of course. And then, of course, it's a combination of six companies coming together in one. So, of course, it's happened a lot. And in fact, the head of Ericsson also met with Narendra Modi in the day today, as did the Toyota Global Chairman. 
Moving on, the first quarter GDP data that was released on Monday came in at 7%, way below the government's expectations. And today, the government fielded its chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramanian, in an attempt to soothe frayed nerves. Subramanian stressed the economy is moving in the right direction and expected the pace of growth to pick up with the ongoing reforms. Subramanian said India's FY16 GDP growth may be around the economic survey estimates of around 8%. I think that, you know, on the GDP forecast, you know, the economic survey said, you know, between 8.5 percent. And, you know, certainly uh, if the, you know, the GDP numbers are kind of uh, reassessed along the lines I'm suggesting, that uh, I would, st we would still stick to our prediction that we'd be closer to 8 uh, than, than currently being uh, forecasted. Well, that's the GDP-GBA debate. But moving on, marred by controversies over the viability of the ultra-mega power projects, the government in consultation with a committee headed by former CVC Pratyush Sinha has made many positive changes to the UMPP policy to attract both developers and lenders. Anshul Sharma brings us the key highlights of the draft bid document floated by the power ministry. In India, currently, there are only two operational ultra-mega power projects run by Tata Power and Anil Ambani-led Reliance Power. Changes in the UMPP bid document in 2013 saw all private companies withdraw at the financial bid stage, citing unviability of the projects. This forced the government to set a committee to revise the bid document. The Sena committee has addressed most risks related to ownership, fuel pass-through, etc., in the hope of attracting both developers and lenders. In the previous uh, round of bidding, we did not see uh, lenders' interest as being high because the asset ownership did not remain with the developer. So that model has changed and we believe the lenders would be more comfortable lending to the projects now. The second fact is the entire fuel cost has been made a pass-through. So there is no concept of escalable and non-escalable and hence you are reducing the bid variables and the complexity that was involved in the earlier bids. The third development we see is the allowance of escalation on the entire fuel cost. So earlier you were allowed the escalation only on the escalable part of the fuel cost. So that has been done away with and now you are allowed the entire escalation on the complete uh, fuel cost. The fourth development we believe is significant is the establishment of a payment security mechanism. The draft norms also have the option of a termination clause, which will allow the developer, procurer and lenders an option to find a substitute in the event of defaults. Also, removal of 15% open capacity norm in the current draft will simplify bids and make it more realistic and prudent once approved. But the sector is worried that the revised document is not completely on the lines of the plug-and-play model as promised by the government. The land procurement is not guaranteed at the time of handing over, so that will still have to be, part of it would still have to be looked at by the developer himself. And secondly, the, all the clearances might also not be available at the time the project is handed over. So all those clearances also will be responsibility of the developer himself. Power sector analysts say while most issues related to financing and operations have been dealt with, the regulator and procurers will have to keep a check on a provision of pass-through of certain costs, like land acquired by the developers, which can be gold-plated later in the tariff, but maintain that all the changes will finally push the stalled UMPP bid process and keep the tariff roughly around 1 rupees 50 paise per unit, which will add to the government's ambitious 24-7 power-to-wall plan by 2022. In New Delhi with Anshu Sharma, Harib Shirwani. Latest as far as UMPPs go. On the other side of the short break, Union Minister Rajiv Pratap Rudi has a grudge against the private sector. We'll tell you why that is the case after the short break. Stay tuned. <laughs>